Hello and welcome to Monet Cafe. I'm excited to bring you this series of painting tutorials that I think will bring you joy, peace, happiness, and learning. What you're seeing now are nine tiny paintings, and I do mean tiny, only two and a half inches by two and a half inches. They all have flowers and happy little bees, which seems to represent a celebration of life and God's creation. In each of the nine lessons, I will give you information as to supplies, techniques, and more. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. I would love that. Rather than working at my standing easel, I decided to work at my large craft table. Now I'm going to be talking about all of these products, where I found my reference images, and also how you can use alternate products if you don't have the ones that I'm using in this video. Many of the products in my videos and in this particular video can be found in my Amazon shop where I have products conveniently organized for you to find. I have categories such as pastel papers, pastel painting products, practical studio tools, do-it-yourself pastel surfaces. So when I refer to that in my video, this is where you go. I always have a clickable link in the description of each video where you can find the products and check them out. I'll be using an assortment of pastels for each particular video, but I will try to give you advice and tips on the colors and values that I select. Also, for each of the paintings, I am using pastel matte. I love this pastel surface. I use the white when I want to do an underpainting, especially like I'm doing in these videos with watercolor. This receives watercolor so beautifully. Now, pastel matte is a bit pricey, so you know I love to give you alternatives of perhaps using watercolor paper with some of your do-it-yourself techniques that I talk about. I do have a video that I'll try to put a clickable link for making your own pastel surfaces. The watercolor I'll be using is this little Arteza 36 watercolor set. I use this all the time. It's really dirty. You can tell I use it all the time. I think I accidentally used some acrylic ink and other products that didn't clean off very well. But I love that it comes with this little color chart where you can fill in each watercolor. And this is so important because watercolor looks so much brighter and more luminous when it's applied on paper rather than it does in the individual little palettes. It, it's much darker. So you need to do this to make correct color choices often. You see how dark it looks compared to that? Um, but anyway, this little set is the one that I use for each of the nine paintings and also easy to find in my Amazon shop. In this first video of the series, you'll see me laying out my nine painting format on this Dick Blick healing mat. I wanted to let you know I got this from dickblick.com and I love it. And here we go. I have my pastel mat. I also have my healing mat and I love that it has this grid system. It helps a lot for measuring. What I'm going to do here is I had it in mind that I wanted to create a layout to have six or nine paintings. The last tiny painting lesson I did had six and I thought I wanted to go even smaller and do nine of them. So what I did is I taped it off onto the grid. You know, it's square. It's measured up on the grid, so I know it's square. By the way, I love my limb tape dispenser. This is artist tape that is so handy to have in a studio. It takes different sizes. I think this one is oh three quarters of an inch or an inch wide but you can buy various sizes all of these again on my amazon shop i hate to sound like a broken record for this however i'm going to be using half inch black tape to make a grid or guide for my nine paintings also back in my graphic design days i love using my t-square and a triangle you'll see me use in a minute for accurate and precise measuring Here's a quick graphic for you to understand what I'm doing. I use the T-square to get my horizontal lines and I use the triangle to move along the T-square to get my vertical lines. So that might help you to understand what I'm doing as I work here. Now, I wrote down that I'm decided on doing two and a half by two and a half little squares. The reason is because I wanted to go with three by three, but the paper wasn't wide enough. So I had to make some measurement decisions here based on the size of my paper. So now I'm just marking off my measurements and my borders, and I know now what the measurements are to get nine of the two and a half by two and a half inch squares. 
And I knew I wanted to keep a half inch between each of the squares because the black tape is one half inches. Now you can see me using this T-square that I'm really just guiding along the sides of my healing mat. Now I'm making my vertical uh, marks or measurements. Once again, keeping a half inch between each of the squares. And now you'll see me using my triangle. It's really just a 90 degree angle that I'm sliding along. And I'm sharing this in case you want to do something similar. My original thinking was to have nine of the paintings with a nice crisp border between them. You know, like you could put painter's tape in between it. And the artist tape would work similar to painter's tape where you can peel it off at the end and have this nice crisp white border between each painting. Well, I'll let you know ahead of time. It did not work that way. I think it's because of the pastel matte perhaps that the watercolor kind of seeped through but I still would do it again this way because I really like, first of all, I use black tape instead of white tape because I wouldn't be able to see the borders that well. And I also liked having a half inch um, distance between them. But again, I would use this method again because I think I would like to frame them all on this one sheet. You know, I could get a mat and cut out little individual sections for each painting. It would really make a neat final painting presentation. And finally, we can get started. This was so much fun. I really needed this. I am choosing some brushes. I love this little art bin. I think that's also in my Amazon shop. It's a very convenient way to keep your brushes. And even though these are tiny paintings, I didn't really use little teeny brushes. You'll see as I get started. And every painting will begin this way, all nine paintings. I like to keep some paper towels folded up to kind of control my water flow as I'm working with the watercolor. I recently got this nice little ceramic dish for holding my water. I needed something bigger for my water. Now this square format worked out quite conveniently because in my photo albums on the pmp-art.com website, I noticed that all of the little images are already in little squares and so it made it really easy for me to have these little thumbnail images to work from. Now let me talk about pmp-art.com. I found the site many years ago and it was such a neat way for people to share their photography and allow artists to use it for painting without a copyright. Here's the um, page of the woman of the first photo that I'm going to be using. Now I'm not going to put the photo in the video while I'm painting. I think PMP has something to where I don't put it up there so it looks like mine, but I'm gonna put a clickable link to this image from the PMP website, pmp-art.com website, um, so that you can use it if you would like to. I'm just using a pencil. This happens to be a Faber-Castell uh, 6B. It didn't get in focus very good. I normally would use a lighter pencil than a 6B, but I tried to go a little darker so that perhaps you can see it better when I'm sketching. Also, I love, this is the best pencil sharpener I have found. I got this on Amazon, and of course, it's in my Amazon shop. It's a German pencil sharpener, and I absolutely love it. Many of these lessons will have a lot of real time, but I'm speeding up little sections like the sketching portion and specifically in this video because this will be the only one of the nine lessons that has all of this intro showing you how I set it up and all of the supplies. And again, for the reference image, you can look in the description of this video and I will have a clickable link to the actual site of PMP, the artist who has this particular photograph. And by the way, PMP is free and you can also follow people kind of like you do on Facebook. So if you want to follow me, find me on there. I think it's just Susan Jenkins, but you can find all of my photo albums and you could just literally look at all of these from my page or photo album section. And I believe most of these were under, uh, you can categorize photo albums. I find it very convenient because sometimes you just want to paint. You don't want to search for a photo. So if you ever have any time where you can just sit down and pick out some of your favorite photos and categorize them in little albums, it makes it so nice when I have a moment like this and I'm like, I want to paint some bees and flowers. Well, Thankfully, I have two photo albums. One's just called Flowers, I think, but I happen to have a lot of bees in them. And one was called Bees. And so it was easy for me when I had this concept to just find them. I have some that are organized by 
landscapes, valleys, trees, all kinds of things, animals. So uh, feel free to get on there and find me, follow me, and use my photo albums if you would like to. Um, so here we go. I've got this sketch and it's time to add the watercolor. I am choosing some warm colors. I'm going to talk about these when I put them up, but I'll also hold up my little color guide so you can see the ones I'm choosing. Now here's my brush I decided on. It's the uh, Princeton Brush Company. The label has worn off, but I see it's a brush that is not as small as you might think for something like this, but I prefer using a larger brush. Uh, the largest brush I can use because I think it keeps things painterly. First I'm using a wet on wet technique. All that means is you're wetting the paper first before you apply the watercolor. It really helps to keep things subdued and again a painterly feel and makes the paint just kind of flow and create more of a wash. So I'm speeding it up now, but you can see I'm working around the flowers. I'm only working on the background and the negative shapes behind the flowers with applying the water. Now, once you have the water applied, you want to relatively quickly go ahead and apply your um, color, your watercolor. What I'm doing here is I'm getting some of that magenta color. I've learned over the years, I used to not add enough water to my watercolor. The water is your friend, so wet it good enough, not so wet that it's all runny because you remember you already have a wet surface, but see how when I'm just touching this watercolor to the spots where I've already wet it, that it's just kind of, it creates a channel, the water that's already there, and it's almost like the water flows into the areas that you've already wet. So now I'm going to be toning this Oxford blue, and I think I use a little bit of the violet. I'm going to be toning the flowers. Now this might seem a little bit opposite here. Why would I tone the flowers a purpley, a purpley kind of um, blue color? And it's because it's the complement to yellow. These are sunflowers, remember they're yellow. So often I will put what is opposite on the color wheel. In some of my other videos, I actually show you how I do this. So make sure you watch all nine of these. This is just the first one because you'll learn something new probably with each one. So now what I'm doing is I'm using a little bit of this darker purpley blue to get the centers uh, because the centers are the darkest thing in this image. Now notice that one did just kind of bleed a little bit because it touched some of the water, but that's okay. That's a, a sunflower that's in the distance and often things in the distance are less detailed, a little out of focus and blurry. And I strive not to have too much detail anyway. I've been really focusing more on having a strong focal point in my latest artwork. And what would you think the main focal point would be in this image? Well, probably that flower I'm working on right there. It's kind of the star of the show. And then next in line would be that flower. All right, so you see I'm using a little bit of the magenta and the purple to just get these centers in. And once again, you can do this with just watercolor. This lesson works for different mediums. And I've got my little bee I wanted to, no, also too. He's of course a focal point too, right? So I want to make sure he's got a decent amount of contrast um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as, as I work. I really just want to get him in here so I didn't forget to not give too much detail on the flower area around him. Oh, so I did use the color wheel in this video. Now, what color are the flowers? They're yellow. What's opposite of yellow on the color wheel? What? That's what's called its complement, a complementary color and it's always the opposite side of the particular color you're using. So I know that it's gonna be blues, and I probably wouldn't be toning all of these petals, this uh, light bluish cool color, if I was keeping this primarily a watercolor painting. <clears throat> I would probably add some of the blue for the shadow sides, but because I know I'm gonna add pastel, we can layer things, and it's really nice to have a complementary color underneath often. So here's the blue that I'm choosing to use for the petals, a little bit of the lighter and a little bit of the darker blue. Now you probably noticed what I was doing before was doing the same technique of the wet on wet. I had applied water to these petals. Now you wanna make sure you let the pink portion dry first before you do this, or it'll all bleed into each other. So, you know, you learn these little tricks as you're working with watercolor and other mediums. But the fun thing is it's all a learning process. You can learn these things. And now I'm ready to get started with the pastel. And what am I doing here? I actually am adding a piece of tracing paper. 
And this is to protect the other areas uh, for painting. I wanted to keep them nice and clean for each new painting. And now we are ready for pastels. And again, this is pastel matte, so it's already ready to receive pastels. I'll talk about these pastels more in a minute, but I'm using a little uh, repurposed Chinese takeout tray and a piece of foam I cut for my for holding my pastels as I use them. Now the pastels I'm choosing here are really from all of the pastel paintings that I do. It's a little temporary storage system I have. I repurposed a box of Sennelier pastels that had come in this. It had those nice divisions in it and this works great for me just to put my pastels in after each painting instead of going back to my studio set that you know is bigger and everything. So it ends up being a great little set in itself to choose colors from. So I'm choosing some darks. You see I've got some darks in the centers of the sunflowers. Often there are some magentas and purples in there. And uh, of course we're gonna have our typical sunflower colors of the golds. Now keep in mind, if you look at that reference image as I'm choosing pastels, do you see there is a shadowy side? Uh, it's like the light is coming from the upper left and really just dancing across some of the petals. So I'm keeping in mind that some of them are going to be brighter and some are going to be more in shadow. This is a little set I like. It's a Sennelier 40 half stick set. I really love this little set. It's got some bright yellows, some really bright pretty colors. I'm choosing some of the purples and uh, bluer tones for those shadowy colors. And um, really just, I don't even think I used all of these colors, but here's the beginning. I will apologize that the beginning of this pastel application had a little technical difficulty. Some of you know I'm caring for my mother-in-law now who's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I wanted to share too that that was one of the reasons I chose doing some of these uh, little paintings and this particular project. I thought it would be therapeutic. Often small painting can be that. You don't take it quite as seriously, have a little more fun. And I find that anyway, maybe you will too. But you're seeing the pastel that I'm using now is a neutral color, okay? It's not real bold in color. And I know some of the petals in the shadowy area aren't going to be as bright and sunny yellow as the rest. Um, once again, you can find the reference image um, in a clickable link in the description of this video. But patrons, if you're a patron of mine from my Patreon page, I will give you the image in your post along with links to all of the products. So that's one of the perks of being a patron of mine. Thank you, patrons. You guys have just been such a blessing to me. And now you can see I'm using one of the kind of gold tones that's a little darker. I'm still working on the more shadowy parts of the sunflower and typically in pastel painting we work dark to light because of the ability to layer. Often it's good to get a darker color down first because it gives the lighter color or the brighter color something to rest upon that's going to give it some contrast and um, interest. So that's why you see it looking darker before I turn on the light so to speak by adding some of the brightest yellows and lighter value yellows. Often too sometimes we we go light too soon um, so it's best to kind of be careful with that. Also notice my strokes um, are very light pressure. I found that was one of my challenges when I started pastels was I went too heavy handed too quickly and I also felt I needed to fill up the tooth of the paper and you know get take away the white of the paper or whatever it was very quickly and you don't need to do that you need to um, take your time with this these colors will start to blend themselves and the color stays fresh and more vibrant the lighter you apply because what pastels actually are pigment that has these little almost like crystals I guess and they uh, shimmer in the light and the more layers you add the more you muddy the colors the more you um, press or um, destroy that ability for the color to uh, be as vibrant as it's uh, as it can be so perhaps keep that in mind when you're working also too, this is real time, you notice the pastel portion is real time. I can't remember if I have the whole thing real time. But the centers, do you see how I added purple and a little bit of that magenta color to the center? Rather than just choosing a black or a brown for the center that we often see in artwork. Okay, so now I'm going to start going a little bit lighter. And whenever you do look at the reference image, you'll see that the light is catching some of the outer petals 
and so I'm just trying to gently work those in. Now this is a Sennelier pastel. I love this brand of pastels, but when they're rolled, when they make them, they often have little, I call them little tails on them. It's not real smooth on the end of it sometimes. There's a part of pastel that's kind of pointy. So sometimes you have to kind of sand it down on another piece of paper or something um, or work with it. I realized too, I needed, I was going a little light too soon, like I mentioned before. I have this other type of orangey gold color that is not quite as light yet. So I'm still gradually working towards the light and I'm also not being so fastidious about the petals being absolutely perfect and I want to have a gestural feel. I want them to feel like they're flowing, maybe blowing in the wind, which it does kind of look like in the reference image. And now I'm finally getting to some of the lighter uh, values, but notice it's not as light as it could be. It's more bright. It has a higher saturation of yellow. It is a little bit lighter in value, but sometimes, like I said before, we go too light too soon, or we feel like we have to grab a yellow that's almost white. And I find paintings have much more color interest when you try to go brighter rather than lighter, if that makes sense. Now I'm going to talk a little bit here while I work about this painting and the paintings to come. Like I've been mentioning, they all have flowers and they all have little bees. And I'm going to give a little example of some of the bee um, techniques, not in this video, but in some future videos. And often I do this. I feel like I have to give the bee more detail than he needs, okay? You know how bees, you see them flying, they're usually full of energy and they're in motion and we want them kind of to appear that way. So I've found that the fewer strokes you can make and having strokes with more gesture and energy really gives the feeling more of a bee because they're usually busy, right? They're in, in flight, in motion. And I found too, and you may find if you choose to tackle this endeavor of nine paintings with me, your paintings will get better as you go along and your bees will get better as you go along. My bees continue to get more gestural and full of energy with each painting. So uh, this bee, that was a precursor to let you know, this bee wasn't my favorite bee that I did, but, um, but I will be giving you more instruction as these paintings progress to get the uh, the fun freedom of a bee and have it represented in your painting. All right, you see I'm just gradually adding some of these yellows. Now back to focal point again. I know the background flowers, um, not necessarily this one I'm working on, but those behind there, they're not going to have a lot of detail because if you give them a lot of detail, they're going to be competing for focal point. A neat thing happens with our eyes and our vision. Okay, here, let me pause real quick. Here I'm adding, you see that pretty, that's another Sennelier. I'm using that little tail or point to my advantage here, um, but uh, I'm adding a little bit of those shadowy colors. You know, I covered up some of the blue from the watercolor, so I'm kind of adding it back a little bit here. Okay, back to our miraculous eyes. I love how when we look at something, like say you're looking at the sunflower, what automatically happens with our eyes because of peripheral, we have peripheral vision, but you can't focus on everything all at one time. Usually you focus on one thing and if you can stay focused on it and imagine sort of kind of looking at the things around it, they're all fuzzy, they're out of focus. Well, cameras don't often do that. They have an automatic setting on them usually where the aperture is set to where it focuses pretty much everything. And that's not to me, if you want an artistic and painterly final painting, it's not the best way to paint. We want to emulate in our artwork usually what our eyes see. And so it's good to find a focal point that you give more detail as if you're looking at it, that's what you're focusing on, and make almost a fuzzy or halo effect of other elements so that they're not competing for attention. I hope that makes sense. So try to paint more like our vision works rather than how a camera works sometimes. Um, I'm being gentle around the bee. Once again, he is part of the focal point, obviously, and that flower. And um, so I didn't want to give so much detail and fine lines to the petals where he's going to be. And that's kind of why I'm uh, taking my time in finishing that area. 
I also wanted to add a little bit more shadow to the uh, centers of the sunflowers. There is an area, like I said, the light is coming from the upper left area somewhere. So the lower right area of these sunflowers are going to be just a tad more in shadow. And for this, I'm using the Terry Ludwig eggplant color. It's really a dark, dark purple. I avoid using black because black is really just void of all colors. So this is definitely one of my favorite darks. Okay, now I'm back to using a Sennelier. I also wanted to mention, I have the advantage again of using this little imperfection on it, the little point, and that makes it easier to get into some of these petals. But some people have commented on how can you use these big chunky pastels for such a little two and a half by two and a half painting? Well, there's a little trick, and I'm gonna be talking about it more in future videos, um, about how you, feel your way, wasn't that in a, a movie like Grease or something? You literally feel your way by just giving a little, almost like a practice touch to the surface with your pastel where you can feel, even sometimes when you can't see where the pastel is landing, you can feel it. So you make a little, little teeny tap or mark and pull it up and you can see where it was. And then you just continue to feel where it was and work your way around. It may sound difficult, but actually the more you do it, it's really not that hard at all. And one thing I find about these tiny paintings is because you're forced to use big chunky pastels with such a tiny painting, it forces you to be more painterly. Often we get too detailed and too fussy and we feel like we have to make all these fine lines and details and things and you really just can't do it in these little paintings. So here you can kind of see how I'm, I just make a little mark and I kind of feel where it is and then I can kind of keep going. Uh, I wanted to add, I've got some of the blues in the top part there that were more um, cooler blues. Now this is would be considered a warmer blue. A turquoise is a warm blue or you could say it's a cool green. If you don't understand that, <clears throat> I've got a video, I did a few videos back on color temperature and I really go into detail about um, color temperature and what it means to be a cool color, warm color and all of that. So, But now I'm adding the warmer blue, um, the teal or turquoise, uh, a little lower into these petals because that's typically how the sky works. We go from cooler colors up in the heavens, usually gets warmer down towards horizon line um, where the sun usually is down further in the horizon. So that's why I decided on this. And this painting, because the sunflowers were everywhere and there wasn't a lot of background, it kind of came out looking a little bit abstract, which I liked, you know, with the um, negative shapes. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now. It's called negative painting. I'm painting the background into the petals. I got the general petal shapes, and then I'm negatively painting in between the petals. You see the petals at the bottom of the main sunflower? They're not really formed all that great, so I, I actually work around them. Now this pastel, you see how it's more linear? It's a harder pastel. I'm not sure if that's a Rembrandt, um, but I wanted to get some of these it might even be a new pastel, a Prismacolor new pastel, spent in, spelled N-U pastel, and those are harder pastels, and they actually have more of a point or an edge to them, but I let color be my guide here. I wanted a color that was kind of that evergreen looking green, so I just grabbed whatever I found, and even though it's harder, can you see the difference of that color versus those teals up there? It's, uh, it doesn't go on as buttery smooth, but that's okay because I know as I add more colors, like now I've got a, a warmer green here that is a bit softer. As I add more colors, all of those little blank spaces or linear looking marks will be blended out by the layering process. So sometimes we worry we have to over blend. We'd get a blending tool and think we have to blend in that little green area because some of the paper is showing through. But resist that urge because, again, you're going to take away the brilliance of the pastel. The more you blend, the more you lose that precious uh, color that's so emblematic of soft pastels. I think it's one of the brightest and most colorful mediums ever. <laughs> I mean, even more than oil painting. The challenge with pastels, one of the, uh, I guess if you want to call it a downside, is that 
you have to frame it. You have to put it behind glass or protect it somehow. I use clear bags from clearbags.com to store my pastels prior to framing or I use them also to ship my pastels in. I even found a neat little way you can have pastel greeting cards right now. I'll have to share that in a video. But you do have to protect them. But I think that adds to their preciousness or um, uniqueness you know they're just so precious they need to be protected um, and they're perhaps a little bit more durable than some people think all right so now I'm working around the bee a little bit and I'm kind of losing him a bit but um, I do reestablish that in a minute again I kind of put my watercolor bee there to remind me not to over layer in that area uh, because I wanted him to still have some contrast and focal energy and this Terry Ludwig pastel was a perfect example of having to feel my way. Now I'm back to using a Sennelier. And now let's turn the lights on. Can you see how bright that is? Now this is a little bit of a lighter value. I've gone a degree lighter in value because this is where the sun is hitting on those petals. It doesn't need to be everywhere. I, I've heard an expression, I can't remember which artist said it, if it's everywhere, it's nowhere. And that really is so true if something is everywhere uh, nothing stands out as important you know it's not it doesn't stand out anymore if you've got that same color all over the painting so we want to reserve those um, areas of the brightest highlights to just where the Sun is hitting in this particular reference image and again I apologize for not having the reference image right next to the painting but when it's someone else's photograph as in this case with pmp-art.com by the way PMP stands for paint my photo it used to be called paint my um, but when it's someone else's reference image I want to make sure they get the glory for it so that's why I put the link to the image in the description of this video so you can go check it out again you might have to sign up for pmp-art.com if you're not not already a member but it's free you know why not I also like to remind you guys that I love your comments. Not only do I love reading them, you guys have given me some great advice and you're what's helped me to know what to provide here. Um, improving my videos, just some tips and things you guys have. All right, back to a Terry Ludwig pastel. It's a big old chunky kind of a rust orangey color. And I'm kind of reestablishing sometimes when the um, petals come into or come out of the center, they are bunched together a little bit more so you're going to create a little bit of a darker value in those areas and it's kind of um, um, segmenting the petals a little bit they were all, all kind of one color there so it's giving some division or separation from the petals it also looks so nice there's a little bit of that purple in the center i don't know if you can see it on whatever device you're looking at but often like i said in the centers of sunflowers and even in the petals kind of where I'm working now you can have some purples and some reds and punch up that color a little bit I can't remember if I added any red um, to some of the areas that I'm working on now uh, usually like right where that petal like I said comes right out of it you can get some pretty rich reds and it always creates interest rather than just going with yellows and browns. Now I'm using a little tool that I've recently discovered that works good when working on tiny paintings. It's just a little q-tip and so what I'm doing again I did not give a lot of detail around the bee because if I had all those petal divisions behind him he would lose his focal interest. So I'm, and I ended up kind of covering up the bee, but again, I remembered not to add like all those highlights around where the bee was, and I'll actually be getting to the bee pretty soon, but I'm adding now, this is another Sennelier pastel, look at that gorgeous yellow, now it's not quite as light as the first one, it's more bright, you know, it's more intense in color, but it's going to stand out because of its brightness. Um, I think I go back and reestablish some of those lighter yellows at the end, just on the tips. Now I'm going in and adding a little bit of this lavender. This is the shadowy area of the flower. It's going to make it feel a little bit more in shadow. And uh, often I use a lot of lavenders and blues in shadows, and shadows and flowers and various other subject matter. So it does make it feel a little bit more like um, the light is behind and above the sunflower, not down in the center in that 
on those lower petals. Now, here's where I'm adding a little bit more of those lightest lights. Like I said, just where it looks like the sun is just dancing across a few of these petals. Notice how the front sunflower is now becoming the main focal point. I put a little bit on the back, but I don't overdo it because it's it's second fiddle to the first one here, okay? And then the ones in the very back back, they're, uh, you know, they're stage hands or something. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing theater analogies. And now let's add Mr. B. I'm using a dark, uh, again, the Terry Ludwig eggplant color pastel. He needs to have a dark base. So I learned this little technique from artist Karen Margulis, just watching some of her bee videos of her flowers and bees. And she's really just so darn good at it. Her bees are so cute. But you put down, she always does three little marks. Sometimes I'll do two little marks, a head and a body, even though an insect usually has three divisions. And then you use kind of a orange or a bright yellow for that center part, just a little mark. Then you put down um, almost like a blue, periwinkle blue, and then you can put down a lighter color on top. Those are for the wings. Now I've got a lighter color, just a little brush, and you can have two little wings coming out. I added some little legs with a, a harder new pastel and a little indication of a little antenna. But again, my bees got better the more that I did, and they just got more fun. So we're always learning, right? So this was obviously part one in the series, and notice all real time for the pastel portion of this, which will be the same for the next lessons. So I hope you will tune in for all nine of these paintings. This video will be the only one that shows my technique for laying out the nine painting format, but it should be a lot of fun. It was a blessing to me, very healing for me during this time in my life. So I hope it is for you too. And if you haven't subscribed, I hope you will. Also, follow me on Instagram, please, at Susan Jenkins Artist. I always forget to say that. All right, guys, that's it. Happy painting, happy springtime, and be blessed. Thank you.